All right. Okay, let me give you a, a quick overview of the sections that we're just going to wave at uh, here. But you, you've seen chapters 1 through 24. That focuses on uh, Jerusalem before its fall to the Babylonians. I'll put your map back up here. I have these, you know, my standard uh, one slide. There it is. All right. Put it up. Uh, so 1 through 24, focus on, on Jerusalem before its fall to the Babylonians. I hope you've seen. That's where we've spent all the time. Uh, you see, you know, what Israel or Judah was doing and how God says, I'm going to come and judge. I'm going to bring the Babylonians against you. And you can see how for Jews, this was such a catastrophic thing for them. It's hard for us to understand where you have the temple there, which is the center of your religion. It is the dwelling place of God, and it winds up in ruins. And God is telling them beforehand, when you see that happen, do not think that I have been defeated by some power. Understand that that's my work judging your sin. Okay, so it was important for them to see that. And the first 24 chapters, he's, he's focusing on that before the fall so they understand God's patience with them. They understand what he endured. They understand how he called them to repentance. And he lays out in many different ways and places the reason he's bringing the Babylonians on them for judgment. Then the second section, which we'll wave at in a, in a minute, is chapters 25 through 32. They contain oracles. That, that section contains oracles against the foreign nations around Judah. And I'll just I'll say a little bit about that in a second. Now let me jump to the fourth section. Okay, the fourth section and final section is chapters 40 through 48. Now the, this is an extended vision that is designed to teach the truth of Israel's glorious future. There's a lot of debate about how to understand these, these chapters from 40 to 48. And if you, you've read them, you know that you have this, you know, the temple and this priesthood and all that. Uh, my reading of it is, is that it, it's designed to teach the truth of Israel's glorious future. And these chapters, in my view, they're a symbolic elaboration of the end time city, the new Jerusalem, the eschatological state, the heavenly state. Now you look at it and you say, how is that? How is that? It is a picture of that state that would be meaningful to Jews in exile. Okay, now, now premillennialists, Okay, those who believe that the second coming of Christ precedes, pre, they precedes a millennial reign, they look at those chapters literally, and they think that there is going to be a literal temple built like that, and that there, you're going to have a literal priesthood that is offering these sacrifices, and I just don't have time to go through, you know, why I think that's off base. Okay, I don't buy that idea. I look at it as it is all a symbolic depiction of the eternal heavenly state given in terms that would be powerful and meaningful to Jews in exile. He paints the picture in terms that would be most meaningful to them. Okay, so that's what I think is going on there. It was designed to, to give them hope in the face of depressing realities that they're, they're looking at, hope that in the future God is going to bring his people into a new age of blessing and a close relationship with himself. It's depicted, uh, it, it's going, it's depicted, it's this ideal existence is shown, a state of pure worship and intimate fellowship with God. And if you read those chapters, you see that's what's being done in terms, as I say, would, make, would be meaningful for Jews. Now, that's the fourth section, 40 to 48. Many people, as I mentioned in the early lessons, just divide the book into three sections. I think it's meaningful to have a third section, chapters 30 to 39. So we have the first, second, the fourth is 40 to 48, then 33 through 39. These, this section emphasizes the hope of Israel. Now the last two chapters of that section, chapters 38 and 39, they're apocalyptic material. You know, apocalyptic material like Revelation. Okay, which by nature, it is symbolic and it is figurative. And so that's important to know when you see that you're dealing with apocalyptic literature, you know, it, it helps to know the type of literature you're looking at for you to understand it. You know, you read comic books differently than you read a novel or a newspaper because they're different types of literature. So when you're talking about apocalyptic literature, you say, okay, this literature has as part of it a lot of symbolism and it has a lot of uh, a figurative image and that kind of thing. Well, this, this section, 38... 
thir chapters 38 and 39 are stuck between the reference to God's eternal dwelling place among the Israelites. You see that in chapter 37, verses 26 and 27. And the elaboration of that eternal dwelling state in chapters 40 through 48. So these two chapters, 38 and 39, are stuck between those two. In my opinion, that's done to suggest that before the final glorified state, okay, before the uh, kingdom of God is consummated, and I use that term, I hope you know what I'm talking about, Jesus came and he inaugurated the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a present reality, but it, is, it, is, it exists presently, it coexists with evil, suffering, and all that, but a time is coming when Jesus will return and consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated at his first coming, everything that is contrary to the eternal purpose of God will be stripped out, and then the eternal vision of God will go on forever. Okay, so what I, what I think is doing here in verses 38 and 39, he's indicating that before that final glorified state, there will be a massive end-time assault by evil forces on the people of God. Now, I understand that not everybody sees it that way, okay? I, I understand that. I'm just telling you how I look at it. I think that's what's being said and indicated in chapters 38 and 39. That is also how I understand Revelation. I understand well that many people here would say that's not the correct understanding of Revelation, okay? But that's how I see it. My view is, is that there before the consummation of the kingdom of God, there is going to be a final assault on the people of God by evil. Okay, I think that's what's being said there. You disagree with that? Okay, you know how that works. I tell you how I think and you say, okay, I like that or I don't. But that's how I see it. Now what I want to do now is I want to park on some text briefly. I want to pick up where we left off. I'll go through and just park on a few things and, and say some things about different sections and then uh, we'll just see how far we get. Okay, but we last left off with chapter 23. We were talking about Ezekiel 23, Ohola, who represents Samaria, and Aholabah, who represents Jerusalem. And the point is, is that like, like Israel, Judah was willing to, you know, Israel was the northern kingdom. You remember the capital, Samaria? Judah, the southern kingdom, the capital, Jerusalem. And just like Israel, Judah was willing to court the favor of godless nations at the expense of being faithful to God when it looked like those nations could save them from difficult political circumstances. In other words, this happened again and again with Israel and Judah. They would be faced with a difficult circumstance or situation, and what would they do? They'd look around and they'd calculate and they'd say, well, listen, we need alliances with these powerful nations, even though it will mean that we will have to kowtow to their gods. Even though it, it means that we will have to compromise our commitment to the Almighty, it is something we must do because of political expediency. And they did this again and again. And they would go and make these alliances and they would do that. And the bottom line of that section is that Jerusalem is going to face the ruin and desolation of her sister Samaria. What happened to Samaria? The Assyrians carted off the Samaritans. Samaritans, they, they, uh, that city and Israel, the northern kingdom, was taken. And he's saying the fate of Judah is going to be the same. They have engaged in the same types of things. But let me just say a little bit by way of application about this. Now, as I say, the history of these two nations, of, of Israel and Judah, was characterized by this willingness to sell out or to compromise in order to win the favor of nations that appeared to be able to help them. And as I think about that, we face similar things, different circumstances, but I think that we are, you know, sometimes more willing to trust what we can see. You know, we are tempted to compromise to win, the, to win the favor of an employer. We work for somebody, he wants us to do something that is, is wrong, that is sinful, deceitful, and we sit here and think, well, you know, he's the boss man, I'm going to go ahead and, do, and see, we think, well, what can I do? If I stand for God and I reject this pressure on me to do wrong, I can't do that. You know, I have to make an alliance with him because he's my boss and all this kind of stuff. We have the same pressure to compromise with our peer group. Or you've got buddies, you know, or pals, they're trying to, you know, trying to pull you into stuff that's wrong. And for you to stand without compromise for God will be, you know, it, it will alienate you from them. And you think you need them to be, have social access or whatever it is. And you see this with peer groups. You even see it in families.
So that's one thing, you know, I see an application. Then something here in verse 39, if you look with me in chapter, let's see, <clears throat> chapter 23 in verse 39. This just strikes me. He says, on the very day they sacrificed their children, Ezekiel 23, 39. He says, on the very day they sacrificed their children to their idols, they entered my sanctuary and desecrated it. This is what they did in my house. And it just strikes me that, that we have an amazing capacity for hypocrisy. We really do. You see people here who are sacrificing their children and then coming in and worshiping God. And you sit and you go, how can that be? How can that be? But we have this amazing capacity. You know, we can cheat and steal all day at work, spend time watching porno movies, having immoral relations with their boyfriend or girlfriend, and then we can just come to church. Just come to church and just, you know, say, hey, this, you know, this is kind of like the Kiwanis Club. We just kind of bop in, say, hey, and leave. We can do that. You know, don't tell me we can't do it. We have the capacity to do it. And here it's something that is that, that God is, uh, you know, not pleased with. In fact, it's disgusting to him. And you can see that in Proverbs 15, 8, Amos chapter 5, 21 to 24, and many other places. This idea of this hypocritical worship where a person has divorced his life from his commitment to God, has divorced his faith from his life, and simply says words, but lives like an unbeliever, lives like a pagan, and then comes and offers things to God as though God's going to be happy with that. And you see this again and again, you see this happening. Then in verse 35, you can see that, that to reject God is to ensure disaster. Now, this is a point that we need to grasp, understand. It may not always look that way. You see, it may not always look that way. You may fool yourself into thinking that you can reject God without consequences, but trust me, when the storm of judgment comes, when that happens, you will know otherwise. You cannot reject God with impunity. Now in chapter 24, in chapter 24, he tells this story this, uh, of the uh, cooking pot, a parable of the cooking pot. And the, he tells this story right when uh, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem. And this is obviously about what God is going to do with the siege of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not going to go through all the points that he makes in here about, you know, he's got certain meat in here and the meat's pulled out indiscriminately. Uh, the people are going to be taken indiscriminately in this siege. And Jerusalem itself is going to be, the pot is going to be, you know, burning red. It's going to be purified. So this is what he's doing when he, when he uh, attacks, attacks Jerusalem. Now, we have to guard against the false notion, see, that our favor with God will immunize us from judgment if we rebel against him. He's made this point repeatedly. But we sometimes get the idea that because I have favor with God, that is favor that he will, I can rebel against him because I am in his favor. I can turn and rebel against him without consequences. That's what Israel did. That's what people tend to do. And that's a lie. Okay. You have to be faithful to God. Does that mean you have to be perfect? Does that mean you have to be sinless? I always have to say that. The answer is no, no, no. Okay, I live in here. I know who I am. I know what I think. You know, I know all this stuff. I know I'm sinful. But there is a tremendous difference between a person who desires to please God, who has a heart of penitence and says, I want to be like Jesus, and doesn't excuse sin, doesn't sit here and say, that's not sinful. That's just me being me. That's not sinful. That, no, who says, no, that is sinful. I confess it. Make me better. I don't want to be that way. That is a completely different heart than the person who says, hey, I like this, and you butt out. Different heart, okay? And you have to get to understand that because otherwise you wind up, as I've said, you know, ad nauseum. If you don't understand that, you won't be at peace because you're going to be sinning. And if you start pulling your hair out all the time when you're sinning and say, oh, I can't make my way. No, it's not about that. Just be faithful. Just get up and be at peace. But don't use that fact then as an excuse for when you turn around and rebel, which is different than stumbling, getting up, stumbling, looking at Jesus, stumbling, stumbling, stumbling. It's completely different. So don't then turn off and rebel. Say, hey, I think I'm going to move in with my girlfriend, start stoning, do whatever I want. 
Live like that till God buzz off. It's different. And see, to, to use the idea that I have the favor with God and think that I can be secure in rebellion is a lie. Okay, it's a lie. And it's a lie that the world uses all the time to try to get Christians to rebel against God and fool themselves into thinking they're not doing so. Okay? This is important because this is holy living. And every time we talk about holy living, if you talk about holy living, you run the risk of being labeled a legalist. Okay? I understand what a legalist is. I also understand the book is chock full of calls to holiness. Chock full. We are to emulate Christ. We are to be disciples of Christ. We are to live that way. The fact we don't do it perfectly cannot be used to excuse rebellion. Okay? Got to see that. And when you see that, life is grand because you're at peace. You're not a neurotic sitting here saying, I did this, I did no. You're at peace because you're walking. You're walking. Okay? That's an important thing. All right, the parable of the cooking pot. Then in chapter 24, the second half, this is very poignant. In the second half of chapter 24, God tells Ezekiel that he is going to take the life of Ezekiel's beloved wife. You know, if you, how can God do that? Look, God is going to take the life of Ezekiel's wife. He's going to do it to make a point. And so he tells Ezekiel, when I do that, you may not engage in any of the customary acts of mourning. Now, that's, that's tough because we internalize the social acts of mourning. And so that becomes a natural thing. And he says, you're not to do that. And sure enough, that night he takes the life of Ezekiel's wife and Ezekiel obeys the command and he does not, he does not uh, you know, do any publicly, doesn't publicly mourn his wife's death. And then the people naturally want to know. They say, what is the meaning of this? This is bizarre behavior. Your wife has died, and you're not publicly mourning her. What does this mean? And the meaning is that God is about to destroy the holy city, the pride of the exiles. See, just as he took the life of Ezekiel's wife and he wasn't to mourn it, he is about to destroy the pride of the exiles, the city of Jerusalem, and to put to death many of its inhabitants. And just as Ezekiel was not allowed to publicly mourn his wife's passing, neither will the exiles mourn publicly the passing of Jerusalem, lest they appear to the Babylonians to care too much about Babylonia's enemies. Can you understand that? This is what's going to happen. He says, when the city falls, you will not publicly mourn and grieve about the city because you're captives in a, in a nation and they're not going to like you siding with their enemies. So what you're going to wind up doing is just what Ezekiel did. You're going to grieve privately. And see, so this is simply another indication that the God who is speaking through Ezekiel, he is the sovereign one. He is the sovereign one speaking through Ezekiel, and that, of course, is, it, it, that occurs. Now, God lets Ezekiel know that he's going to be rendered unable to speak for some time until a messenger arrives from Jerusalem with news of the city's fall. And the point of that, his silence, the point of it is to, it's a sign to the exiles that the matter is closed and that God is now carrying out his promised destruction. Okay, with the, with the parable of the boiling pot there, you have this begins when Nebuchadnezzar lays siege. Ezekiel is not going to speak until a messenger arrives and says the city has fallen. And that happens in chapter 33, verses 21 and 22. Okay, chapters 25 through 32, we're going to wave at those. What they are, that is a, a, a second major division of the book. And those eight chapters, they're oracles against the foreign nations. And it's important to see that God is not some local deity. You and I grew up not having a problem with that. You know, we understood that God is God Almighty. He's the God of heaven and earth and this kind of thing. But in that world, see, gods tend to be localized. And so it's very important to see that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob isn't that way. He's the God of all. It doesn't matter where you are. What na he's not some kind of territorial God, and he's judging these other nations. Okay, he's going to judge these other nations. Now, the fact God is judging Judah doesn't mean that he's taken up the cause of Judah's enemies. Isn't that how people act? When Judah falls, you've got nations around here celebrating and saying, see, that's what's happened. 
You know, we're being vindicated, but that's not it at all. He's not judging Judah in order to bless Ammon or Moab or Edom. On the contrary, see, those countries hated Israel and her God. Those countries hated Israel and her God. He's not taking their side in judging Judah. You know, he's not doing that at all. The very fact that their hostility toward Israel is a key reason for their condemnation shows that despite Judah's outrageous conduct, and if you can just remember some of it from the first 24 chapters, if you can just remember some of how Israel, how Judah has treated the God Almighty, it ought to make us shudder. The question ought to be, how has he borne with them this long? Not how can he destroy them. It ought to be, how can the Almighty God put up with this? But if you can remember any of that, isn't it absolutely amazing that despite Judah's outrageous rebellion, God has not given up on Israel? He is still Israel's defender. He is still Israel's defender. After all they've done, he is severely disciplining Judah now in bringing the Babylonians on him. But what is he going to do? He is going to bring them back. He promises them a glorious future. And the glorious future he promises them is the future in which we share as Christians. Because Jesus is the Davidic Messiah. We serve a Davidic king. We serve a Jewish king. He is the one that God is promising. He is the son of David who is promised here in Ezekiel. So they are blessed. We are blessed with them. You know, the church, right, is Jewish at its root. I've said all of this stuff many times. The church is Jewish at its root. You have biological Israel. You have true Israel, which are the people who reflect the faith of Abraham who are Jewish. Okay? And then you have new Israel, which is true Israel, the people of the faith of Abraham, the Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, into whom Gentiles who have the faith of Abraham, those who believe in Jesus Christ, are grafted. So we, the church is Jewish at its root, and we are grafted into that. We are the heirs of these promises of restoration and glory that he is saying to these exiles, and it's all part of one piece. You are scattered now, but I have not forgotten you. I am going to do a great work through you. I am going to restore you to Jerusalem. I'm going to restore you to this place, and part of this restoration will be a glorified kingdom under the Messiah. And you and I share in that. You and I share in that, although we await its consummation. Here he says, he talks about, he's got prophecies in chapter 25. You have prophecies against Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. 26 through 28, you have prophecies against Phoenicia, represented by the cities of Tyre and Sidon. In chapters 29 through 32, you have prophecies against Egypt. Okay, that's all I'm saying about chapters 25 through 32, okay? So there, there is the, uh, you have this, this, uh, this chapter where we have these condemnation or oracles against foreign nations. Chapter 33, I want to say a few things about this. Chapter 33, he revisits this idea of the watchman that he'd, he'd raised before in chapter 3. And in verses 1 through 6, you know, Ezekiel is there told in, in chapter 33, he's told to remind his countrymen of the role of a watchman. His duty is to sound the alarm, you remember? And what happens after that is the responsibility of the hearers. The watchman sounds the alarm. He says, hey, danger, something's coming. And the responsibility after that is... is it's up to the hearers. Now, his prior words about the watchman, they were directed to Ezekiel. But here, what God is doing, he wants the exiles to understand. He wants the exiles to understand that Ezekiel has not been somebody who has been, uh, you know, he has not cursed Judah. In other words, Ezekiel hasn't been a voice who has called down harm on Judah judgment on Judah. He has not cursed Judah. Rather, he has faithfully fulfilled the role of a watchman. He has been one who's been calling out saying, repent, repent, repent. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. He has done that noble act. He has not been saying, curse him, God, judge him, God. He has been saying, the judgment is coming. Repent, repent, repent. And so he wants them to understand that. Then it's verses 7 and 9, he reminds Ezekiel that he made him a watchman for the house, and that job's not finished. And I have to read in, verse, in chapter 33. I've got to read a couple of lines out of here because this to me is, 
This is the good news about our God. And in verses 10 through 16, Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 10 through 16, Ezekiel is, is instructed to console the wicked with the hope of repentance and to warn the righteous of the danger of rebellion. Look in verse 10. He says, Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you're saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I take no pl I don't care what the caricature is of God in our culture. The caricature of God in our culture, which is designed to pull people away from him. Look, we're in a spiritual war. Okay, there is a spiritual battle going on and you have to understand what's happening. Okay, so the caricature of God in our culture, which will turn people off, they don't want to look at this God, is he's just this mean, nasty God sitting up there just looking for an excuse to send somebody to hell. That's how he's portrayed. You! Death! Judgment! Kill you! Actually, hate you! And he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes none. Okay? Hear that. Hear that, he says. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Repent. That is the call. Repent. Now, what do you do to somebody with, with somebody who sits there and says, I don't want to repent. I like living in sin. I understand that. When Brother John brought the gospel to me, I was a stoner, boozer. I understand it. You know, sitting here, and in fact, he, we laugh about it. One time, he was a Christian in May of 78. I became a Christian in June of 78. And I, I told him one time, I said, listen, you can do what you want to, but I'm not going to quit drinking. That was my hobby. In fact, that John, my oldest brother, said to John one day, he said, you need a hobby. And he said, I have one, drinking. And see, so what do you do? You, you have to choose. Now, what we as people of God cannot do, we cannot sit here and say, that's okay, don't repent. Because you're lying to people. Okay? Door is always open, but the door is open on God's terms. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but you have to come to me. You have to give it up. I don't want to get choose. There are two roads. Choose. You're going to take me or you're going to take you. That's it. I'm going to be Lord or you're going to be Lord. So you have to pick. Now you pick. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to create a third channel where you get to do what you want to do and then say to me that you're doing what I want you to do. Can't do that. And what I urge, you know, say to the church is that don't allow the culture to tell you that you are somehow mean-spirited when you simply are calling people to repent. You're not hateful. You're loving. I'm telling you the person that's hateful, the person that's hateful is the person who doesn't love somebody enough to be willing to bear their anger at them, to tell them what they need to hear. That's the person who's unloving. But that person comes and all of a sudden, oh, no, you know, I'm really, no. You have to tell people the truth. You got to tell them. And the truth is, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn. I don't care what you've done. Now, isn't this, isn't this wonderful? I don't care what you've done before you became a Christian. I don't care what you've done since you've been a Christian. The door is always open. Now, who is a God like that? Isn't it Micah in chapter 7 who brags on the mercy of God? He says, who is a God like you? who forgives as freely as you do? There is no God like that, but our God. He is merciful. He's wonderfully merciful. So whatever you've done, you know, sometimes we get into things and sit here and think, oh, you know, my sin is so bad. I think we had a brother who died uh, from a ruptured aneurysm. He was uh, four years older than I am. He died when he was 39 years old. And I always felt like he, came, he was a Vietnam veteran, and he did things in Vietnam that were he felt ashamed of. 
One of them, he killed a 12-year-old child. Uh, other things that I don't even know about. But he carried a burden with him. And I always felt that he, that he just really couldn't accept the magnitude of the mercy of God. And that's where people are. And see, that's the trap. He will forgive all, but you must come to him. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many times you've done it. Okay? You pick the vilest thing you can think of. The church and Jesus Christ is open to sinners. You just come. But what we cannot do, we cannot do is to tell people, you stay that way and you'll be right with God. Mm -mm. Okay? That's really, really important. Okay, he then says, he says in, uh, see, in verse 14, if you pick up in 14, he says, and if I say to the wicked, if I say to the wicked man, you will surely die, but he turns away from the sin and does what is just and right. If he gives what he took back in pledge or loan, surrenders what he's stolen. See, this is just indicating a penitent heart. If he repents, okay, and does no evil, he will surely live, he will not die. And of course, in verses 12 and 13, he says to the righteous, if they turn against the Lord, They'll be condemned for their rebellion. Their prior loyalty won't save them. He made this point before multiple times. But that a person who sits here and says, listen, I served God for however many years, two years. I've known people. You've known them too. I've known people who've been preachers. I've known people who've been elders. You know, decided they'd just give their wife the boot and go off and do whatever they want to do and leave the church, move in with, you know, whoever. Uh, just do that. And live a godless life. Now, do you think that God sits here and says, well, that's cool. You were faithful to me for five years. You served mightily for ten years. No, he cares about your present heart. See, that's the flip side. The beauty is, is that wherever you are and whatever you've done, come home. Isn't that the prodigal? Come home. Door always open. Come home. Flip side is, you can't sit here and turn around and say, hey, God, I'm taking a hike. I'm leaving. And then turn to God and say, you and me, we're cool, right? Well, the answer is no, but you can be if you'll simply repent. Okay, he goes through that. The watchman revisited. I can see we won't get too far. The shepherd and sheep allegory in chapter 30. Oops, I got to say something else here. Sorry, 30, in chapter uh, 33, I marked little things I wanted to, to touch on. Now, I love this here. We have uh, in chapter 30, 33 in the second part of it. In 21 through 22, you get the news of the city's fall. It reaches Ezekiel as he had has prophesied, and then he's able to speak. Remember he said, you're not going to be able to speak until you get this word. Here comes the word. He's able to speak. Now, it's not clear whether 33, chapter 33, verses 1 through 20 were delivered before he was silenced or after his speech was restored. But what I want to look at just briefly here is that following his vindication now, okay, Ezekiel had been prophesying what he'd been saying. Listen, the city's going to fall. You got people saying, ah, they've been talking that way for centuries. All talk, no action, not going to happen. You know, look, they always sing this song. You know, they're negative Nellies, whatever. And so he's been saying, God says, I'm bringing the Babylonians. You're going to fall. There's going to be great suffering. I'm going to destroy the city, destroy the city, destroy the city. Well, when the city falls, well, now Ezekiel's credibility is up. You see, he's now recognized that, hey, he's been vindicated. And so he becomes quite popular. A lot of people are going to hear Ezekiel speak, but they wouldn't put his words into practice. You see, his words, even then, no more penetrated their dull ears in popularity than it did in unpopularity. If you look in, in, chapter, in verse 30, chapter 33, verse 30, he says, As for you, son of man, your countrymen are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, Come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. You see, they, they say, this guy's definitely a prophet. I mean, look, he was preaching this stuff for seven years, and look what happened. It just came down right down. It just came. So I said, let's go, let, you know, come on, let's go in here. Hear the word of the prophet of the Lord. And he says in verse 31, my people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words but do not put them into practice. There is nobody who has ever stood in front of people and preached the word of God who has not felt that. That people are simply coming there and sitting here saying, oh, this is kind of nice, this is kinda, and not engaging God. You see, when a person preaches the truth of God 
And you have to be careful. You have to use your judgment and say, is this the voice of God or not? Is this the voice of a man? But people who preach the word of God do it that people will meet God and be different as a result of it. But I can't tell you now. I, you know, people sit here and it's just like, shoo, shoo. it's like coming, you know, you want to go to a play. Well, how did he do? Well, I thought he had a nice flourish at the end. I thought it was this and that. But the question is, have you engaged God? Has God come to meet you here and said to you, you must this or that or be this way or glorify me or see me this way or, you see, and I, so I just, this is just a beautiful thing when he says this because it is something that is timeless that we see and that we experience. Okay, shepherd and sheep allegory, then I'm gonna have to shut up, I think. Okay, chapter 34. Now here, here we have the shepherd and sheep allegory. I think Wayne messes with me. I know he does. Okay, okay. The prophecy against here in the, ver the first 10 verses in, in Ezekiel chapter 34. The first 10 verses you see, this is a prophecy against Israel's irresponsible shepherds who are the kings. These are the kings of the Jews who have served them poorly. So that's who the shepherds are. They're the kings there. And the Israelites are referred to as God's flock. And the focus of the allegory is on the kingship, the shepherds in Israel. And with few exceptions, you know this, with few exceptions, the kings of Israel ruled for their own advantage rather than for that of the flock. And see, what we take here, we have a counterexample here, though he's talking about bad rulers, bad kings, shepherds. We learn from this what a good shepherd is. You see, and when you look in, in chapter 34, verse 1, he says, For the, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You've ruled them harshly and brutally. So what was the result of this bad shepherding, this bad leadership? He says to them, yeah, he says that they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. He's writing to people who are scattered. They are in exile. And he says to them, you had shepherds who were worthless. And I say, you know, to shepherds in the Lord's church, you see how important leadership is? Now, in our individualistic society, we don't like that idea. We do not like the idea that, listen, congregations depend on their shepherds like it or lump it okay shepherds are there and they have this responsibility to lead and to guide and to oversee and this is their role and if the shepherds don't do that bad things happen to the congregation you don't have crummy shepherds and have a glorious congregation it cannot happen okay shepherds take care of the flock. Now, does that mean I don't have any responsibility? You know better than that. You know better than that. But don't think that because you have responsibility, the elders here are irrelevant. They're not. Leadership of the community of God is vitally important. Okay? Vitally important. And they have to see that that's their role and their function. A lot of times they get trapped in so much administration and stuff. Okay, it's because they're the workhorses of the congregation. Okay, you know how much time they spend? I already talked about this. How much time they spend doing this? And then to have people sit here and grumble at them is just really uh, unappetizing. <laughs> you know, they really, it's just hard on them. Okay, but this is an important thing. And you see the kinds of people, you know, the shepherd cares about the sheep. The shepherd's not in it to sit here and say, listen, I can be glorified. I can gain this, I can get this. Shepherd cares about the flock. What is necessary for the flock? What will benefit the flock? And when you put that into the church, you're saying, what will bless the congregation? How will God be glorified? How will he be, Christ be exalted? What can we do to enhance that? And that's it. And not selfishness. And that's a very, you know, it's an important thing. 
an important counterexample from which we can learn an awful lot about shepherds. Okay, I'll say a word about the last part in the 30 seconds, 10 seconds I have. Okay. Chapter 34, 23 through 31, you see that at some point after the return from exile, God is going to place his servant David, that ought to ring bells, his servant David as a shepherd slash king over the flock. At some point, now this is what I was trying to get at before, you see, this is all one piece with the return from exile. And what happens with the return from exile, you have he's going to put the Davidic Messiah in place. Well, we know that didn't happen for centuries. That's Jesus. And then the consummated kingdom is yet to be. So what happens in prophetic perspective is you have these mountaintops that the prophet sees and there's an awful lot of topography between them that he's just looking at the mountaintops and so it's sometimes difficult to see which aspect is he focusing on because it's all of a piece. Israel comes back to the land, the Davidic Messiah comes, then there's this glorified eternal dwelling with God and he's looking mountaintop, mountaintop, mountaintop and he's going like that. So sometimes it gets confusing because these things are blend in this telescoped perspective. Okay, and I could tell you some more about that. But anyway, second bell, class is over, Ezekiel's over. Thank you for coming.